Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us at Retro Rabbit for our final Rabbiteer session of the year. Today we have a really special presentation, um, and that's uh, it's really special because those of you who signed up have probably got a couple of little weird devices in front of you. Um, because Celia today is going to tell us about the Internet of Things and particularly how you can do it really cheaply these days, which is amazing because if you're thinking about lots, you know, activating every, well, connecting every single thing in your, your house to the Internet, ideally you want that to be a, a cheap process. If you're going to be playing along with your laptop and engaging, uh, you need to join our Slack. And if you do that, you can go to rabbiteer.io or uh, I think you can go directly to rabbiteer.slack.com. You just put in your email address, you'll get on it. Um, that's just a way for us to talk to you, send you things. Um, we're going to have to request a password and things like that in order to get going. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming. And it, here we go, Celia. Okay, here we go. I'll start with a statement. Rapid inexpensive prototyping is a catalyst for innovation. Today's topic is Internet of Things on the cheap. And uh, what brought this about is this. <coughs> this is the device we used the last time. It's particle electron and it costs $20. This is the device we're using this time. It costs $3. And that it includes uh, shipping <laughs> from China. Um, I got these last year ago. They're slightly different from the ones you have. It's called a Node MCU. It's based on a little uh, system on a chip, microcontroller, not really system of a chip, little microcontroller that they developed in San Francisco. They get manufactured in China. And uh, we bought them on AliExpress, and I'll show you uh, the website I've got here so you can just see that I'm not lying. This is what we bought. You see it costs $150 for 50 of them. And that's, those are the devices you've got. And uh, as you can see, the, that includes shipping, free shipping to South Africa and uh, $150. So why is this important? Well, this is important because if you want to mess about with something, uh, experiment, innovate, paying $20 for every time you try something is a bit much. But if you get something like this, and we are sitting on the other, world, other side of the world from China, and uh, we pay uh, about 50 Rand for each of these, and it can do many of the same things that the other one can do, the particle electron. The particle electron is way more powerful than this, than this thing. It's got an ARM processor. This has got a custom thing. But when you really work with microcontrollers, you realize that processing power is not really that important. Um, this thing is about as powerful as an Arduino, a bit more. And the differentiating factor, of course, is that it has Wi-Fi. And uh, we are going to work with those today. Now, if you have one of them, um, be sure to plug it into your computer. It should the, the light will start glowing. Uh, it should, anyway. And um, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But let me just cover the agenda, what we're going to do. First, we're going to uh, just check and get these things started, make sure everybody's connected. Um, I've got some... Uh, instructions for downloading the drivers are already put on the general channel on Slack, the link that gives you a, uh, an instruction for um, how to get the drivers working in your PC. And uh, if you need help, there's supposed to be people helping uh, you guys, and I think they're all standing outside, except Tibojo. So if you, if you need help, stick up your hand and somebody will come and help you if you get stuck. So. Um, we got to connect the device, we're going to read some data, we're going to tr transmit it, we're going to receive it, and we're going to display it. And uh, I'm going to be handing some other things out as we go along. The first thing we're going to need to do is get drivers. Now that link, which is simple enough that I, uh, you can just type it in your browser, uh, is a small guide that I put up that shows you how to get the drivers. For brevity, I'll show you quickly what it is. Uh, you would plug it into your computer, and then uh, right-click and go to Device Manager. And um, what will happen is uh, you won't see what I'm seeing. Uh, you will see in other devices, it, w it, sh it should appear, a new device should appear there. And you're going to right-click on it, and you're going to say Update Driver. And uh, you will see the screens that you have to go through on the, the link that I sent. Uh, I can't show them to you because mine is already there. 
actually it's not plugged in, but if I would plug it in, it would be there. Um, so I can't show you how to install the drivers because I already have them installed. But this is what it would look like once it is installed. You will see it there. It won't be the same, but uh, take a note of that COM port there. Uh, this thing is freaking out. There we go. Next, you're going to need to download some tools. So go to that link and it will download the tool. And uh, you're going to be downloading it from my laptop. So it should be quick. Um, but uh, take a note of that link. It's bit.ly slash mcu dash tool. Um, I try to make it short enough that you can just memorize it. And the last thing we're going to do is the code. Uh, I'm going to be going through a lot of code. And unless you're copying really fast, you won't be able to keep up. So all the scripts can be found there. That is a link to our GitHub page uh, on uh, Retro Rabbit. And uh, I'll show it to you so you can see it was bit.ly slash mcu dash code. And uh, this is what you'll see. This is all the source code related to this project. So all the things you're going to see is open source. Um, uh, some of the things made by others, some made by us. Um, but the one that you're going to want to be interested in is that one, the Rabbiteer 2017 IoT scripts. This contains all the scripts that we're going to be programming the devices with. Um, and it also has images showing uh, how to connect the various items. There you can see. That's going to be important. <coughs> so um, let me see quickly. Is anybody downloading? Yes, I'm sending at 10 megabits per second, so I think some people are downloading the tools. Um, unfortunately, we only support Windows. The reason is, uh, even though everything is cross-platform, I had very little time to, to, to smack everything together, and I only have a Windows PC. So if any of you uh, are budding uh, developers, you can, get the source code is there. You can try and get it running on, on Linux, uh, on Linux or Mac. Um, so once you get it downloaded and running, uh, you'll get this. And before I go on, I just want to uh, explain something, and that is I'm going to go a bit faster than everybody else because we have limited time. Um, afterwards, you guys can stay as long as you like, and we will try and help you out, and whatever crazy thing you want to do, uh, we, we will help you do that. For now, I'm going to go through the slides one by one. I'm going to do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. And, um, uh, but uh, I'm going to be a bit ahead of you guys. I hope that's OK. Question? Uh, Celia, can you just make the text a bit bigger, if possible? <sighs> I did. This, this application doesn't listen. Um, it, it should be okay. I'm not going to show this too much. I'm going to be with the slides the most time, so it should be okay. But if I'm showing something, I will make it bigger, like, like so. It's a bit stubborn. So, zoom out again. Has anybody got this thing running yet? One person. Anybody else? Is anyone having trouble? Silence. I know you guys are downloading it. I can see it. <laughs> Sorry, Mac guys. Uh, I would have helped you if I could. Either way, I'm going to go on. And once you guys get the thing running, it's simple. You just extract it somewhere. And you run the one that says node mcu-tool.exe or something. And you'll get this. And now what this is, it has these components. Over there is, the, is the, what you need to connect. So you'll click on the drop down, you select the, the one that looks the most Chinese, and you connect, and, uh, and then it should connect. This is after you've got the drivers running. If you don't have the drivers running, you won't see it in the list. So be sure to do that first. And again, if you have trouble, stick up your hand, and somebody will come and help you. Uh, this bottom part is, part is a terminal. It's actually a serial connection to the device, and uh, the device is hosting a terminal emulator, and you can type commands into the device while it's running. And that's how we're going to be programming it. 
Uh, the Node MCU is unique uh, in that it runs um, a Lua virtual machine. Who here has heard of Lua? Has worked with Lua? Lua is a scripting language. It's notable for being fast and using, uh, not using a lot of memory. So it's perfect for running on a microcontroller. This thing has 64 kilobytes of RAM, which is not much. Um, but it's more than enough for running a Lua virtual machine and uh, you'll see it works rather well. Um, <coughs> so we're, we're going to be connecting to the device using this terminal and, uh, and in here we will see the files. It has a small file system in it, it has four megabytes of flash and so uh, we'll be able to put files on the device. And this is just a handy editor. Uh, it, do it doesn't do anything other than uh, work with the files here. But here are three buttons that you'll be able to see and I'll show them to you quickly, they're important. Um, Whatever you write in the editor here, this button will save it as a file on the device. That button will run it, and this button will run whatever you've selected. So if you just select, select a little bit, and you, you click uh, XX selection, it will run. So before we go on, I'm going to connect to a device, and we'll see how it works. So I'm going to take one of them. I'm just going to plug it in. Of course, my drivers are already installed. Um, I'm going to click there and click reload, and there I see it in the list. Mine says Silicon Labs, yours are not going to say Silicon Labs because uh, I got these before I got the 50 new ones for, uh, for the Rabbiteer session. So yours will say something, something that looks like it's from China, it's some WCN.CN or something. So I'm going to click on it, I'm going to say connect, and then if I go down, you'll see here uh, connected. And if I focus on it, I press enter, you'll see that um, unfortunately my screen is, it's popping out the bottom of the screen, which is unfortunate. But uh, over here is the command prompt and I can see if I press, uh, that is really unfortunate that it's not showing. There I pressed a com uh, typed in a command showing me how much memory is left and uh, you can see it, it runs. Your computers you'll be able to see less. I'm going to quickly see if I can get the resolution on my computer down a bit so that we can see what's going on down there. Um, I'm just going to change this to 125. It should be okay. Let's see if that worked. There we go. Now we can see the bottom. So there's command. And if we look at this, we've got print welcome node into you. And if I Go down here, I press Control Shift V. I need to press Control Shift V. Control V is not enough, unfortunately. Um, but if I press Control Shift V, it pastes in, I press Enter, it prints it out. And that's how you work with the device. I can save this file uh, as, so as something, and it asks me a file name, but we'll get to that a bit later because if I save this, it's not really going to work very well. Um, let's continue to our slideshow. Zooming out. Okay, so that's what we've got. The editor is there. You can, what you can do is if you go to the GitHub and you see the scripts, you can paste it in there. You can edit it, and then you can use the buttons along the sign to execute it or to save it. Okay. Another thing. I apologize if PowerPoint crashes. It crashed earlier. If it happens again, I'm sorry. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at MQTT. Who of you have heard of MQTT? Okay, so MQTT is a publish and subscribe protocol that is used predominantly by uh, Internet of Things devices, small devices that connect to the Internet and publish and subscribe to topics. They use it to communicate. Um, it's not necessarily useful for MQTT, but pretty much only MQTT, pretty much only IoT uses MQTT. So whenever you do Internet of Things, somewhere you're going to get MQTT in the loop. So what does it do? The simple topic is <coughs> you subscribe to a topic and you publish to a topic. A topic is, for example, this. Uh, without a slash in the front, there's not supposed to be a slash in the front. That's a mistake. But say metric slash temperature slash my thing. That's going to be one of the topics that we're going to look at. And you would, for example, publish um, temperature updates to that topic. And then any, anything else can subscribe to that topic and then receive the messages as they come in. So uh, let me show you an example. This is the first thing we're going to do. 
Now, uh, to connect, we have an MQTT server running on iot.rabbiteer.io. Um, but for, in order for you to connect, you're going to need the username and password. And in order for that, Stefan um, has a list. So Stefan, if you would, uh, say your name on the general channel. And then if any of you, excuse me, if any of you want a username and password, send him a DM and ask him to send you a username and password. And he's going to pick some out of a list and send it to you. The reason is uh, he needs to do that is you cannot log in multiple usernames at the same time. So uh, he's going to send you a username and password. And if anybody uh, can figure out that all the usernames I selected has something in common. Uh, so uh, you're going to be able to see the usernames a bit later. But if any of you can figure out what they all have in common, uh, you get a free power bank. And uh, this may be, seem like a cliche thing to give away. I've, I've seen many places give it away, but it has a specific purpose for us. And that is, I can take one of these devices and I can plug it into the power bank. And all of a sudden, my device is mobile. Uh, and now I can take around, it's not restricted to my PC anymore. So here we have this little display displaying temperature updates, and it is uh, not connected to my PC. I can go put it somewhere. It'll last about 10 hours, I think, on, on this power bank. <coughs> okay, but let's go on. I'm going to connect to this device, and uh, I've already connected it. <coughs> I'm going to connect to this device, and I've got my own scripts uh, here somewhere. Here we go. And I'm going to follow my own example. I'm not that one, this one. And I'm going to uh, copy and paste this, the code into the device as we go on. This thing is not connected anymore. Connect. <coughs> so the first thing we need is a client, uh, a client ID that is uh, the, identif Oops. the identifier for uh, your device. And uh, you need a password and a URL. The URL is iot.rapporteer.io, and I'm sure that's easy enough to remember. The next thing uh, that you do is you create the client. So you, you, if you type in this code, it's going to create the client object that you use to connect. So uh, the client takes the client ID, there's a keep, al keep alive of 60 seconds, a username and password. We made the client and the username the same just to keep everything simple. So let's run that. I've got my own configuration here. You can steal my password if you want, but uh, I'll just uh, assume that you guys will ask Stefan, and he will send you. So there I entered that in. And, and those are just, def def if, you're, if you're wondering what that's doing, that's just defining variables. So if I type equals, any command that I start with an equals, it's going to print the result out in the console. So I type an equals client, and you'll see it spits it out in the, client, in, in the console. <coughs> so I'm going to take the next code, which is this. I'm going to copy it again. Or I can just say, execute selection. And as we can see there, it executed it. If I now press equals M, it will spit out some nonsense to say there is something there, as opposed to nothing. Let's go back. Um, the next step is we need to define some functions that will handle the messages and errors and, and when it's connected and so on. So this is the function that, handle, that will be called um, when it receives a message. And we see all that this thing does is it prints out, I got a message on this topic, and this is the message. And then the next thing is an error. So <coughs> this is a specific thing that it does. This will be called if there's an error, if it disconnects or something goes, else goes wrong. And what it's going to do is it's going to print the error and it's going to restart the device. Um, that's kind of a cop out because when you restart, it's gonna, um, it's just gonna start going over, uh, going uh, over the connect sequence again. So uh, the reason we do it this way and not do the auto auto reconnect is because if it's auto reconnect and it fails very quickly, uh, your device is gonna screw itself up. And by the way, if any of you do happen to get your device in a, a loop that it it reboots very fast and you cannot work with it anymore. Um, one of our guys here, Tebojo, will reflash it for you, uh, reflash the firmware. We've got our own firmware running on the devices that we kind of tweaked a bit. Um, 
and uh, Tebocho will flash it for you again if you happen to break it, basically. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to copy in those two things. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to say execute selection. And you see it, it does nothing because uh, it's just declaring some functions. Um, next, we need a handler for when it's connected. So we cannot subscribe to topics or publish messages before it's connected. So we have a function that gets called after it's connected. And this function, we're going to subscribe and do our publishing and so on. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to print on out the serial port that it's connected. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to subscribe to a channel, that specific channel, Slack slash MQTT. Hint, hint, there's a reason it says Slack in the beginning. We'll look at that. Um, the second command is the quality of service. Don't have to worry about that. Just make it zero. And the next one is going to do is publish the message. So it can say hello from and dot dot. If you haven't figured it out, concatenate strings. Uh, and so it'll say hello from, in this case, Celia2. So in. Let me copy in that function. So I'm going to select it. I'm going to say execute selection. There we go. It again does nothing because I'm just declaring it. And the next step is connect. So this is the call to connect. This is the one that, that does all the magic. And hopefully it'll work. It takes a URL. We've declared that variable, a port. That is the kind of standard TLS port. Secure is one. Uh, yes, we are secure. Um, I, I kind of get the impression, Google, that uh, Googling things that people tend to omit this, but yes, all communications from this tiny little device is encrypted using the strongest encryption that's available today, which is interesting. We're setting auto reconnect false because that's what they recommend. And these are the two callback handlers. This one will be called if, if um, it uh, connects successfully, and this one will be called if there's an error. Now, because we put in the error reboot, if there's an error, this means that uh, normally it will mean that it's just going to start over. But for us, it's going to mean that everything is gone. The reason is we're pasting these things directly into the console, the terminal, if you will. And it's executing them kind of in a re-evaluate print loop. Um, but it's not on a file. There's no files on the device. If, the, if I press this little reset button on, on it, everything is going to be gone. Uh, and I'll show you next how to make sure that that doesn't happen. <coughs> uh, but before we go on, you call the connect, and the next thing we do is bind the message handler. So this is just saying, on message, call that function. Simple enough. It works. It's the same as Node.js also tends to have that. So let's put that in and see what happens. I'm going to copy that. And I'm just going to say XX selection. Let's see. Now it looks like it's doing nothing, but it's connecting. Here we go, connected. It published that message, and we see we got the message. We get our own message because we subscribe to a topic and then publish to that same topic. So yes, you get your own messages if you subscribe and publish to the same topic. But an interesting thing, I'm going to go to Slack, and I'm going to show you something. If we go here, we'll see there's a channel called MQTT. And it says, hello. And that is because I've written a program that is subscribed to all the topics on, on our uh, MQTT broker. And anything posted to a, a, a channel a topic underneath Slack will post it to the same channel in Slack. So, and it works both ways. So let's see. Uh, hi, back. As you can see, I've been testing this all day. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> so I say hi back. And let's go back to our terminal. And we say, here yeah, I got the message. Hi back. And I see somebody else. Who is Tenebris? Hand up. Congratulations. <laughs> First one to connect. <coughs> As you can see, I've kind of been a bit hasty. I have barely debugged any of this, so if the, any of this crashes, I apologize. <coughs> but there we go. Uh, and now, the uh, interesting thing is this: I still have access to these variables, uh, so I can publish a new message. So I can do this, um, and let's change it to, um, I'm going to post to general. I'm going to 
to change the message to our channel. Hello from a very small device. Let's see if that works. Can somebody verify? All of you said, have <laughs> I don't think the ad channel is working. Um, but uh, here we go. I got uh, a message from my device. Now you can imagine that this kind of gives you some possibilities. You can configure this thing to, for example, uh, let's say I connect a little sensor that triggers whenever somebody opens the door, my front door. I can make it post a, a message to Slack and uh, whenever somebody goes into my house. I can make it, if I post a specific message in Slack, this device is subscribing to that and it opens my gate or something like that. So lots of opportunities, fun things. <coughs> so to summarize, where's my PowerPoint? Go back. So, uh, any message posted to the topic Slack slash whatever will be delivered to Slack on that channel. And any message posted on Slack will be posted to the same MQTT topic. So, we've got a little program running and you will see it, if I open it here, it's running on our IoT server. And we can see here I'm getting the messages. Got Slack event of type message, so I've got the logs open here, failing the log file. and. Uh, that's running on our server, and we'll keep that running after today. So if you guys take these things home, we're going to keep this server running as long as it doesn't cost us too much money. Uh, it, it costs us about a couple of hundred grand a month, so it's, it's not too bad. Uh, unless you guys manage to DDoS it, we'll keep it running, and you guys can, can keep using it for whatever. <coughs> okay, moving on. Next, what I want to do is for us to uh, actually take a reading of something. So we've got these. Um, this is an AM 2320 temperature and humidity sensor. Um, I want to try something. Because it's so far away, I think you guys won't be able to see. But there you can see what it looks like up close. So uh, that's, that's how the little sensor looks like. And uh, what it is, it is, uh, for those of you who are, who, who are technically minded, it's an I2C uh, temperature and humidity sensor. It's low cost uh, and uh, high durability. I know it's high durability because I've shorted these out to the point where they were almost smoking and they didn't break. Um, so uh, be careful that you plug them in correctly because it's going to burn something down if you do. Maybe fry a USB port, so do be careful. Um, <coughs> So we're going to look at these. These are also from China. We bought them. They cost about a dollar each. And uh, this is the description we got. One piece new AM2320 digital temperature and humidity sensor. Original, authentic, can replace HAT20 SHT10. That is the kind of descriptions you get when you buy stuff of China. And not only that, this is the data sheet. For those of you who maybe have worked with electronics before, a data sheet is usually very well organized. It's made by specific software. It's what you expect. This is what a data sheet looks like for these things. Uh, this is, this is, this is the, the introduction to your paragraph. And I'll just read. Temperature and humidity combined sensor, AM2320, digital temperature and humidity sensor is a digital signal output has been calibrated. <laughs> Using special temperature and humidity acquisition technology, Ensure that the product has a very high reliability and excellent long-term stability. <laughs> it's been uh, written by Google Translate, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I feel sorry for the people who wrote, but we, we didn't write the code to, uh, to uh, actually communicate with these things. Somebody else did. And I feel sorry for them because it must have been hard. I don't have it open here, but it's like 30 pages of that. Um, Google Translate, very technical things are telling you uh, which order to, to press these messages and so on. Uh, so fortunately, somebody else did that. But that's the kind of thing you get when you, when you use these really inexpensive components that you get from China. And at this point, you may be wondering, well, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe, maybe it's just worth it to pay a bit extra and, and get something proper. Uh, the thing is, even those proper things are made in China. Somebody from America just kind of composes it into a way that it's more 
usable. Even places like Texas Instruments uh, and, and proper component manufacturing, their manufacturing is in China. Um, so the, the myth that everything from China is low quality uh, is really passing away as more and more of the things we use actually are made in China. As we know, all our iPhones come from China, all our Samsung devices come from China, and they're all made in the same place where these things are made. So um, moving on, this is how you will connect it. Now, I've uh, done a bit of effort so that the color schemes match the pictures. So we've got these little wires, and uh, it will match the colors in the picture. So make sure that you connect these in the same place. Uh, and then it will work and not fry out. The one you need to be specifically careful of is these two. If you swap these two, it's going to set itself on fire. So we've got 10 of these. Actually, I've got two of them, so there should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh -huh. Some are missing. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you've got seven of these. Hands up if you want one of these and you want to play with it. Okay, if somebody can help me hand these out to those who are picking up their hands. <coughs> Here's another one. <coughs> so, let us see. So, um, you can imagine how it works. You connect it like this. That, that's power. That's clock and data. Um, and uh, we're going to communicate with it with code. The code looks like this. First thing, we, de we declare two variables. One is the data pin, the other is the clock pin. We see data pin is pin one, that's the purple one. Clock pin is pin two, that's the gray one. And then we do that. First, it sets up I2C, and for those of you who don't know, I2C is a communication, it's inter-integrated circuit communication, I think it stands for. Maybe somebody else would know what it really stands for. Anyone? Um, I2C is, is typically what you use to communicate things be between devices on a circuit board. Um, uh, if you think about it, w when you use a LAN cable, that's also communication between two different uh, integrated circuits, but this is for just a very short range uh, and not really as high speed as, as Ethernet, for example, but it's very simple. So a device as small as this can with minimal, they've got hardware support for I2C, so you don't need to write any software to be able to use this. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so it is, it's as simple as that to do it. So let's, let's do that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reboot this device. I'm going to disconnect. I'm going to... Uh, actually, I can connect. I can do it this way too. You can press the reset button. Just make sure that you disconnect before you do it or the thing freaks out. Um, it will be fine, but you're gonna it's going to be weird. But I can also see node.restart and then you can see it restarted it prints a bunch of gibberish out and then it ends with this node MCU Rabbiteer edition build I was up late that day um, and then remember those words can't open a knit.lua that should give you a hint of how you make sure that the program doesn't go away so everything that we did up to now is gone the file is still here and I can if I run it again uh, it's going to run the program again as before but I'm going to get rid of that and we're going to start with the new stuff. So where's the new stuff? So I've got, by the way, this, this, this is all the stuff from the GitHub. I've just put in my username and password. So you guys can see this exact stuff that I'm copying and pasting. Here we are, stuff from the slides. I'm going to copy that, test the pins, it initializes, and see if it works. I should probably connect it first. So let's connect it, simple enough. <laughs> Make very sure you connect the, the uh, voltage the correct way around. You're connecting to the three volt and the ground. So it's very low, vol it's low voltage, typical voltage for uh, microcontrollers. Uh, plug it in here. There we go. Uh, do yourself a favor and when you do that, just kind of feel it to make sure that it isn't burning up. And then I'm going to uh, put the, the data pin and the clock pin in. And I'll show you guys a picture so you guys can see what I did. This is what I did. 
can see I put the, now this is mirror image, so that might not be very helpful. <laughs> so remember that it's a mirror image. But you can see I, I just plugged it in the same place that the diagram is, and it, and it looks like this. <coughs> so I'm going to run the, run the script and paste it in there. There we go. There were no errors. If you see there transmission error, something went wrong. But I didn't see it, so it's good. So next step, I'll just show here. Let's get a reading. This, this code, what this does, it calls am2320.read. That reads it. And then we just print it out. So let's do that. Got the code here. Going to copy it. I'm just going to copy all of this into this little workbench here. I'll select that. Execute selection. Enter. And then we see that's a reading. <coughs> here we go. Humidity 37%. Temperature 27%. It's lying on my laptop, so it's hot. <coughs> okay. So that's all good and well. And I hope some of you figure that out. But um, we'll get it working like this, get it reading temperature and humidity. And again, if any of you have trouble, uh, stick up your hand to Boho or somebody will come and help you. But now, that's... Yeah. So, random, random question. How different is the AIM-23200 uh, library from the original SHD20 library? Uh, I, have, I don't know. Um, I don't actually know if there even is a library for that, for the, for the, for the other one on the Node MCU. Uh, let me quickly see. By the way, I forgot to do this. I only need to give you this link. Um, this is the documentation for the Node MCU library. So everything you do with a device is, has documentation, and I forgot to, put, to give it to you guys. I'll put it on Slack here on the general channel. Um, if you guys need the documentation, go there. So here you can see there's the AM2320 library. Um, I've seen the code. It's not much. It's just basically ITC. Let's see if there's a SHT20. Uh, no, I don't. According to the description on AliExpress, it's supposed to be a drop-in replacement. However, I've read that that is a bit of a generous description of what it does. So they say it's a replacement. Maybe it's the same. If it's ITC, I would say it would probably work. Um, but I don't know, unfortunately. They do say it's a drop-in replacement, and I have read people that say, yeah, no, it isn't. <coughs> so, um, so that's great. And uh, uh, we can read the temperature. I'm going to do a little tweak, and uh, I wonder if it's in my slide. I can't remember. So that's what we get out. So before we go to NQTT temperature, I want to show you something else. If you look at the script, you'll see it does this. It has a function, and I'll declare that function. And uh, that way, when I call that function, it'll get a reading. You can see I called get temp, and it got a reading. Um, now, the next thing I can do is create an alarm. It's timer.create colon alarm. And then 5,000, that's milliseconds. Auto says it's going to repeat, and that's the function to call. And so I'm sure you can imagine if I run that, it's going to start spitting out <coughs> the uh, temperature and humidity every five seconds. There we go, there's the first one. Now, the reason we want this is because, of course, we don't just need to know the uh, temperature and humidity by reading the serial port. We really want this to be published on MQTT. That's really what we want to do. So let's go ahead and do that. So that's going to be a combination of the previous two things we did. Um, <coughs> so uh, we've, as before, we've got our client password and URL. We've got that. I'm sure uh, you all, those of you who have usernames and password, you can put that in there. And then we declare the, the pin numbers as before. And now we start kind of combining things. So this is the function that's called after, after you're connected. <coughs> the first thing we do, so we don't do this before. We do this after it's connected. Uh, the reason is that might fail. And if it fails in, in your startup method, you're going to put your device in a reboot loop. But so this, uh, it waits for connection. Once the MQTT is connected, it sets up I2C. And then, uh, and then it goes from there. Let me just go, uh, go back and, and let me start. Uh, let me get that script ready. So we've got this script. If you guys 
are following along, MQTT underscore temperature. And uh, here we go. <coughs> so the first thing we did is we set up the I2C, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create that alarm, same as before. And this time we're declaring the function in there. So you can do that too. You just declare the function in line as you would in, in JavaScript. Lua, even though it's a really old language, is a functional language. And so functions just work like variables. So here we do the same thing as before. We take a reading. The difference is we don't print it out. We publish it. M, that M, just to give you a note where that M comes from, the on MQTT connected tag gives you a variable M. That's the client. You can use that to publish and subscribe. So it publishes, it publishes to metric slash temperature slash client. So dot dot uh, concatenate again client. That's my device's name. It formats it uh, in, in a normal string format, uh, just like it did when it printed. And those are zeros, uh, quality of service and the retain. But don't worry about those. So it publishes the temperature, it publishes the humidity. And uh, that way, we, we should be able to get our messages through MQTT, our temperature readings through MQTT. So that's what the function looks like in its whole. Uh, you guys will be able to see it. I won't go through it again. So it's got the unconnected. It creates, it sets up the IGC. It creates the alarm. And inside the alarm, it publishes and subscribes. <coughs> the rest is before. We've got an error handler that restarts if there's an error. And we've got the connect code. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to reboot the device. Uh, I'm just going to press the reset button. You see what happens. It does this. And then for some reason, it doesn't work. I don't know why it does this. If you're using a different uh, software, like PuTTY, for example, you can use PuTTY to connect to the thing through the serial port. It doesn't do this, but this one does. So I need to disconnect and restart again. You know the restart is successful when it does this flashy thing. When it's pulsating slowly, that means it's connected to the Wi-Fi. Connect again. There we go. I've got the code here. Oh, let me copy the code out from here. This is going to copy it all. Nope, not there. Paste it here. So you can see there's my new username, password. And let's say execute current file. <coughs> let's see if it works. I can't remember if it prints out if it's connected. It does not. It's not rebooting, so I'm going to assume it's connected and doing fine. Now, I have set up something that will help us a bit with this. And that is, if you go to iot.rabbitier.io, I've got a Grafana server set up th there that plots out these things. So I've got the app that, th the same app that th did the, the marshalling the messages between Slack and MQTT, it's also listening in here. And you can see we've already got somebody else on there. You can see who's it? Uh, oh, that's me. Um, George, you beat me. <laughs> Look at that. You got, you got on there before me. I see you dropped off again. <coughs> so you can see here it's, uh, showing a graph for, for all the devices that it's monitoring. Um, if any of you need access to this, I forgot to give somebody access to help you with to get in here. Let me quickly see if I can remember how you get me. You need to log in. If any of you need a login for this, just pop a message on Slack and I'll give you and I'll and I'll add you on here. Oh it's taking long. Let's move on. Anyway, so here you can see that's that's pretty cool. It's reading the temperature, and here we can see, so uh, let's see, if I, where's my exhaust? So my computer is running nice and hot. I'm going to put the, the temperature sensor in there. And let's see what happens. The humidity, if I were to guess, I would say the humidity will drop and the temperature will go up pretty, pretty quickly. So let's see what it does. Let's give it a few seconds. It refreshes every five seconds. Wow, look at that. Now it's really going up. Well, not much. It's the top is 29 and the bottom is 26. You can see now it's really going up, measuring the temperature of my computer. You can already see there's, there's, there's applications here. You can um, put it somewhere in your house. And you, know that oh, you know the temperature. And you need put it inside your PC or your fish tank or something. I'm pretty sure it's not waterproof, so don't put it in your fish tank. Um, I mean, reading humidity. Uh, look at that. The humidity does go down. Reading humidity inside a fish tank is not a very helpful metric. <coughs> That's pretty cool. So um, we've got the Grafana running, and uh, it's making the readings. So let's move on to the next thing. Display. 
So we're going to display using the 10 pieces white color 0 0.96 inch 28 by 64 OLED display module for Arduino 0 0.96 I2C SPI communicate. This is, this is literally what they call the things. I'll show you. It's like they put the entire description inside the title. This is what it is. This is what we bought. Uh, you can see there, I just copied that out. And this is what it cost. Um, so it's $26.80 for 10 pieces, free shipping as before. And uh, they got delivered. Now this is the challenge. They got delivered after three months, I think. So you order these things from China. They're really cheap. Delivery takes forever. The funny thing is, that's not China's fault. That is South Africa's fault. Um, <coughs> they come into the country in about a week or two, and then they get stuck at the post office for the next two, three months. It's very depressing. Um, just a note, you'll see there this. Who knows what the 1111 sale is? Okay, 1111, for those of you who don't know, is the biggest sale day in the world. Um, we tend to think that everybody's sitting in America. They're not. They're all sitting in China and India. And uh, AliExpress, or Alibaba, is the world's biggest online store, not Amazon. And 1111 is the world's biggest sale. Every, every year that they have the sale, Alibaba's stock price jumps about 10%. <coughs> because they sell so much. They sell billions of dollars of equipment. And the reason is they have sales. So you see there, 10% off. So if I bought this in two days, this is in two days, by the way, good timing, two days before the 11-11 sale, I would have gotten 10% off. But they have crazy specials. I bought my phone on the 11-11 sale last year, and uh, it's a cheap China phone, but it's got a 1080p um, display like every other phone. It's got a camera like every other phone. It sucks, but it's there. Um, it costs 2,000 Rand. So uh, that's quite a step down from... Even though the quality is not the same, it's, it's cost about a fifth of a Samsung, if you get, get a top-of-the-range Samsung. So it's a fifth of the price. It's not the same performance, but it's not a fifth. So uh, keep a lookout for this if you've got some spare money. And really, the things really are $2. So if you've got 50 rand to spare, you can buy one of these. Um, you'll get it sometime next year. Let's go back. <coughs> so this is what it looks like. And again, as you might have guessed already, we have 20 of them. So uh, again, hands up if you want one of these. OK, will somebody help hand out? <laughs> <coughs> also, uh, Jay, just, just get these two. You're going to need one of these two. So they come, th this time I didn't spend time soldering 20 of those. They fortunately just plug in. Um, so this is what it looks like. It's got a very tiny display. Uh, and if you just see pictures the whole time, seeing how small it really is, is they are really tiny. Uh, but it's an OLED display, and it works pretty nice. This is how you need to connect it. And again, you'll see this diagram on Slack. Just make very sure that you notice that these labels are wrong. The order is correct. From left to right, the order is correct. As you can see, green, yellow, orange, red. But the labels are wrong on the device. Um, but you'll check, obviously, they're labeled on both sides. So ground goes to ground. V, VDD goes to 3.3 volts, and so on, as you can see there. <coughs> so again, this display works with I2C as before. So the process is going to be very similar. You've got your data and clock pin, and then you've got a bit of a longer setup procedure. It uses something called UAG to do the graphics, and anybody who's worked with something like this before on Arduino would know, would know that library. It's on Arduino as well. They pretty much just um, gave it some Lua bindings. Um, and it basically sets it up. Nobody cares what that means. Uh, this is a function to print. and. Uh, <laughs> Fun. Remember, if you take one of these, you're obligated to do something with it. <laughs> so do something fun. So this is how the display method works. It basically does this thing where it says disp colon first page and the repeats until disp next page equals false. So this is just whatever. This is the meat. And as you can see, it draws a frame. 
Uh, and, uh, do I have the device here? It's not working. This one is rebooting the whole time, so I, I messed up the config. But basically, this is what it looks like. I'll give you an example. Oh, never mind that. I'll give you an example afterwards. <coughs> so that's the code to display, and um, we're creating this function that displays a message, and you call it like that. And uh, let's uh, skip the fun and just do it. Before I do, I just want to go back. I missed one thing. If I want this code to run, uh, even if the d device reboots, the thing I need to do is click that button that says Save Current File. So I can check it. I can reboot it. And then uh, it's, you see it says cannot open init.lua. So that gives you a hint. So I'm going to execute the file. And just to make sure it works, we really need to make sure it works. Do not, um, ah, that it did not work. My taskbar is giving me a hard time. Just want to make sure that I think it gave an error for me now. I want to make sure. There are minus five. It's like it's not connected to the Wi Fi or something. I'm one fear I have is that we're completely messing up the Wi Fi. We're putting quite a lot of tiny devices on the Wi Fi. I'm gonna run it again and see if it works. <laughs> Run it again. Am I supposed to hide? There we go. I think it's working again. We can verify in here. Not here. Where are we? Grafana. Here we see the device is connected. So what I'm going to do now is uh, this is the code for the temperature logger thingy. I'm going to save the current file and I'm going to save it as init.lua. Okay. Now I'm going to do something brave. I'm going to disconnect it. Um, I'm going to connect it to this other one. And now it will have remembered that, or that script. So it will run it again. We can verify. We look at it. The blue light comes on. That means the Wi-Fi is connected. And then it kind of stops. It stops because it's busy connecting to MQTT. And there we go. It's connected. So if we go back to Grafana, let's see. We can see, you really can't really see, but let's change it to the last five minutes. There we go. We're getting new data points. So it's working. So now it's working without having been connected to my computer. It's been saved on the device. It's really quick. That's kind of the little bit of an advantage you get over flashing it like, like usual. Um, <coughs> Flashing the firmware takes about a minute. This is just, you run it, you can uh, just enter commands. Of course, it's not connected anymore. So I pressing any there is not going to work. <laughs> it's connect a new one. Um, but that's kind of the advantage. It's a bit quicker to, to experiment and to make something very quickly uh, because you don't have to compile it. You don't have to flash it. You're just on the device. If you reboot it, everything is wiped and you can start over. <coughs> so let's get the next script, the one for the display. Um, let's connect the display first. You can see. Uh, let's go to our presentation and yeah. and observe the diagram. So we've got the green pin is ground, the yellow pin is uh, VCC, the voltage. So we plug it into the one that says 3.3 volt. And the one that says ground. Again, do not swap these. If you swap these, the thing is going to set itself on fire. And I know because I did that. <laughs> and somehow they didn't break. And then the data pin and the clock pin. And you'll see initially nothing happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I've got the code here. I'm going to copy it in bit by bit. So I'm going to select that. I'm going to say exe execute. Oh, no, no, that's not going to work. I need to be connected first. There we go. You see the file. By the way, that files thing, you, was, you would have noticed it added that init.lua little files thing. There we go. We're connected again. Uh, I'm going to execute the selection. There we go. I don't know why my taskbar is, is deciding to 
Nope, not task manager. It's going to fix the taskbar. It's really annoying. There we go. Um, so I'm going to, it looks a bit different. I'm just going to call this directly. This is the code, as, you've, as we've seen before, that initializes the display. And something interesting is going to happen when I run that. So execute selection, enter. And we see it's gibberish. <laughs> it's quite interesting. This thing has a very short-term memory. So it's actually remembering what's in this data buffer. But when it goes off, just random things is in the memory. So it looks like this. So let's put in our, um, uh, I'm going to show you. Let me just put it up here. So this is what it looks like. Salt and pepper. But that means it's initialized and working. So don't freak out when you see that. So I'm going to run uh, this method. This declares that print function. I'm going to execute the selection. There we go. <coughs> and uh, I'm already initialized, so I can just run that. There we go. So that's our little string. And then I'm going to execute that. And that is going to print our message. And there you can see it says, Allegedly, hello world. No, I'm not going to see that. Trust me, it says hello world. <laughs> <coughs> and I can then change the message. So I can take that. Let me zoom in a bit. I can take that now. Copy it. I paste it in there. Control shift V, remember? Yeah. I put in there. Here's so. Very imaginative. <laughs> and that's what it says now. Yeah, let's zoom in at the same time. <laughs> it says it's like left aligned. Not very helpful. Um, but this kind of gives you an indication of where we're going with this. So um, just to recap on the commands that we just did, it calls draw frame. That's the little box on the outside. It calls draw string, which displays the message. X coordinate, Y coordinate, and then does this thing called draw disk. And it's drawing the upper left and lower right corner of a disk, so it looks kind of like a funny symbol. And that's what you're—that's the funny things you're seeing the whole time. Yep. Things here to the side. Sorry, it's so blurry. But the thing is tiny. It is what it is. <coughs> okay, so that's how you use this little device. It's quite straightforward. Um, so th obviously, the next thing we're going to want to do is connect it to the internet, Internet of Things, and all. So this is the script that we've got, and I'm sure you can imagine what it's going to be. Uh, PowerPoint, come back. Connected. So we've done that. Yeah, show something. Hello world. Temperature display. So set up as before. Client password URL. We've got the name of the sensor, and then there you can type any of these in. Um, that's on here, and. Uh, does so anybody need access to this? Did they put the message on there? I see no messages. Um, I can give you access. I'll, I forgot to, to assign somebody to do this. So if you want access, I'll quickly digress and give you access if you want. Um, you can just, I think you can just register and put your email in there. Anyway, it's iot.rabbitier.io as this. But now if we want the temperature sensor, I see it's only me left. So it's going to be have to be that one. See. It can be any one of these. So we've got Celia, Celia 3, and Tenebris. Celia is gone. That's one lying over there. It's not connected anymore. Celia 3 is the one that's connected now, this one. You can see the humidity going up and the temperature going down as I've taken it away from the fan in the nice uh, inverse squared, um, what, would, what would that be? Logarithmic. Nice little curve that we see there. As we can see, it's related to actual physical realities. It's not just made up. <coughs> so but, but we can select that sensor and then we can subscribe to it. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to take this script. I've got the MQTT display. I'm just going to copy it all out um, as we go through it bit by bit. And paste it in here. I'm going to reboot my device again to get rid of everything. And I'll show you. So I, I restarted now. You can see it restarted. But the display is still there. The ITC is not initialized anymore can't communicate, but the display remembers. So, so that's kind of how it works. It's got its own little um, processor on it that manages the, um, the display logic. Um, so let's go through this code bit by bit. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of the sensor it's listening to. 
So we've got Celia 3 publishing. I'm going to change that. I'm going to say Celia 3 is going to listen. So I'm going to take this. Uh, let me just go through the presentation and do it that way. I went. So I've got the sensor, and I've got the data pins and clock pins. So it's just, as before, just both things. We've got the display setup. We did that. Uh, we've got, and then we've got this. So I've declared two variables. The one is temperature, and the other one is humidity. And you can see I initialize them with this weird strings. That's what it's going to display when it has nothing. So when it boots up, that's what it's going to display. Then I've got the print function. And as before, first page, repeat, draw frame, just to put a little box around it. And then it draws the temperature, it draws the humidity. Temperature, concatenate temperature, concatenate C, and humidity, and percentage. And then those are the topics we're going to listen to. So we describe it as metric slash temperature slash and then colon dot dot sensor. That's the variable we declared before. It's set to Celia 3, which corresponds to this as before. And then this is our function. So we need to now, when the message comes in, we need to do two things. We need to check the topic because it's now going to listen on multiple topics, one for temperature, one humidity. We check the topic, and if it's temperature, we assign it to the temperature variable. If it's humidity, we assign it to the humidity variable. There we go. If topic equals temp topic, then temp equals message. Otherwise, if topic equals humi topic, then humi equals message. And then it updates. And it's as simple as that. Next, it is unconnected. So we do the sub subscribing after it's connected. You see it subscribes, subscribe, temp topic, humi topic, and that's it. Again, the error handler and the connect handler. It's same as before. So let's, and then it, it prints the initial blank values, just so you can see something's happening. So let's do that. You've got it here, some variables, some initialization, blah, 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 blah. It's quite big. I'm just in the wrong place. Should be here. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to execute and see what happens. Here we go. Let's see. Connected. And that means we see the temperature displaying there. I'm going to show you a blurry representation of what it's doing. And as you cannot see, it's displaying the temperature and humidity in there. So it's displaying the temperature and humidity that that device over there is recording. So now, of course, if I reboot this device, it's all going to be gone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save the current file as init.lua. It takes a while. Oh no, it's failed. It happens. So I'm, doing, I'm just going to reboot it. It worked once before. That's all I can say. Let's try again. Fingers crossed. There we go. Got the need.lua file over there. By the way, those buttons. If they're confusing, that one deletes the file, and that one loads it into the editor. I know it's a pencil, it's going to edit, it doesn't edit, it just loads it into the <laughs> window to the right. So you can see it. So are you sure you want to load init.lua? Yes, I'm sure, because it's going to wipe the whole thing. There we go, it's exactly the same, so nothing lost. But we now have the advantage of I can unplug this thing. I can take one of these power banks. I can plug it in here. And now I've got my temperature and humidity to display. And wait for it, wait for it. It takes like 10 seconds. It's, it's a bit annoying. <coughs> it takes like five seconds to connect, and then it needs to wait for the next topic to come. Or maybe it's not working at all. Who knows? I think it's busted. <laughs> oh, no, wait, there we go. It's drawing a random line down there, but <laughs> other than that, it is displaying actual numbers. So you guys can pass this around and see what it is. Just be careful that you don't drop it or something. <coughs> and that's how it works. <coughs> Pretty fancy. So, recap. Let me get to my last slide. <laughs> recap. What have we seen? We've seen that these little devices that we got from the internet for next to nothing, this thing costs 50, 50 rand. Uh, the wire costs like 20 cents each. 
The displays cost like 30 rand each. The temperature sensor costs like 30 rand each. Um, so it's like, what's the math? It's about 100 rand, 120 rand for uh, one of these that displays and one that reads. So say about 100 rand for each of these. Now, if you were to buy something else, even if it was an Arduino, 100 rand wouldn't even get you an Arduino. <coughs> so we really drive the cost down a lot. And this is Wi-Fi. It has a bunch of GPIOs. It has, P it has pulse width modulation, just one, not six like uh, Arduino. But it has many of the things that you would want from an Arduino, and it's got Wi-Fi, and it's really cheap. So you guys can take these things, and you guys can experiment now. And uh, what we have next is, uh, for those of you who need to go, I know, know there's a hard train deadline, uh, you can go, but, but I have a box of sensors here somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? Seriously. I have a box of, of 30 different sensors. Gerard is waving. I assume he has it. I've got a box of 30 sensors. I've got a box full of breadboards. Uh, if you really want a breadboard. And I've got a gazillion of these connectors that you see here, various different kinds. You guys can grab one of the sensors, you can see what's in there, and you can hack it out if you want. You can, uh, and we'll stay here and we'll help you with it. And, and if you want to play. Or you can take it home, you can, you can grab one of the breadboards, we have 50 of them. Sorry, there's a question back there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ready question, other than you think... <laughs> Wait for the mic. Otherwise, the people who watch it on YouTube won't be able to know what's going on. <laughs> okay. Um, random question. Other than using Node MCU for its sheer coolness factor, why not use um, the Arduino plugins for these, for the Node Micro or the these devices, the 8266s? Absolutely. You can do that. Uh, for those of you who don't want to go into the Node sheer coolness, trust me, it's a problem. Uh, we'll t you'll check on the GitHub that the firmware we're using is our own firmware. We didn't do that because we think we're so cool. We did that because the original firmware is quite broken. <laughs> and uh, we had to fix quite a lot of things. Yes, so you can actually use the Arduino plugin yes. straight away and write your code in Visual Studio you know, with breakpoints and debuggers <laughs> and you know, other cool stuff without having to write your own bootloader and you know, minor <laughs> things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so th it is Ar Ar Arduino compatible. And it also has its own, um, Espressive, the company who makes the, the microcontroller that's on the Node MCU, has their own SDK. But I'm sure most of the people would just use the Arduino stuff because there's tons of support for it. Um, so that's to answer your question. You're absolutely right. We did the Node MCU route because it's, it's new, it's different. There's also a Python version that runs on these little devices that you can also use. Um, didn't try for that one. But the Node MCU has the advantage of being really simple. You need zero software on your computer to use it. We just had this thing that I wrote in the past three days, uh, and you don't need a compiler and so on. But, of course, if you want to go in a, even a little bit deeper, you wouldn't use Node MCU, even though you can. You, you would probably just write firmware for the, for the thing. So, another question. Yo. Um, I just wanted to ask about the bootloader for the Wi-Fi. Are you making it available, or can you show us the connection? <coughs> to connect it to Wi-Fi, that's a good point. So um, inside that repo that I shared, the one with the scripts, there's a file called Wi-Fi. And this is what it looks like. You set the SSID and the password. You set its mode to station and you say configure. You won't need to do this, yours is already in station mode. But now this is saved to the flash, so you, you don't need to put it in your boot script, you can just run it and then it's saved. That's why none of you had to configure Wi-Fi. We went to the trouble of running this on all the devices beforehand. So yeah, any other questions? All right. Do we have the, the link to the GitHub repos within Slack? Uh, I'll, I'll put all the links on Slack. If you have a memory, it's bit.ly slash mcu dash code. Uh, it's on the Retro Rabbit GitHub. Well, we'll put it on Slack. Cool. <coughs> I'm going to read a quote from someone. It'll come up eventually. 
or not. That's anticlimactic. <laughs> I, I spent all day getting all these stock videos together. This is my Eric Schmidt. <laughs> stuff. I said it would crash. <laughs> the quote is gone. <laughs> there we go. The internet will disappear. <laughs> Prophetic words. I was doing all these fancy things uh, and putting all these videos in and PowerPoint just really doesn't like it. The internet will disappear. There will, be no, there will be so many IP addresses, so many devices, sensors, things that you're wearing, things that you're interacting with, that you won't even sense it. It will be a part of your presence all the time. And we're seeing this more and more. Um, we get... We kind of don't realize that it's happening, but all of a sudden our radios and our cars are connected to the internet. Our cell phones have been connected to the internet for a while. Uh, devices like these, and if you buy just the device, it costs 20 rand. 20 rand for a microcontroller that you can integrate into whatever you want and connect it to internet. There's a new one that came out called the ESP32 that has Bluetooth, and it also costs like 30 rand. So these devices are becoming cheaper, and as they can be become cheaper, we're going to see more and more innovation. We're going to see more and more opportunities. And those of you who are students, you're entering into this world. When I was in university, we couldn't do any of this stuff. <coughs> I couldn't go online and buy something from China, and, and yeah, sure, I have to wait three weeks for it to get back. Oops, the battery's dying. Uh, you have to wait three months for it to arrive here, but it's... It's so cheap that even, a, even somebody who doesn't have a lot of money can afford it. Oh boy. Battery. Um, and so the opportunities are endless. Um, we're seeing more and more that the world of hardware is becoming more like the world of software. If I make a program, there's no cost in me experimenting. And it's always been that, that you needed an engineer to design hardware. And when I say engineer, meaning that there's a design process and it takes months and months to design something and then you need to send it off for manufacturing and you need to make very sure that everything is legit before you can, go, can move on. That's not the way that software works and industries are starting to realize that if you want to develop software on a large scale, you need to be more agile. And we're moving into a time and a new generation where you can do this with hardware where you can iteratively refine hardware at, at low cost and manufacture uh, at low cost as well and low turnaround times. We're already seeing that, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, it's an article I read on, on the internet about Kickstarter. And somebody went on Kickstarter and they designed a case for an iPhone that has a selfie stick attached to it. I don't know why you would want that, but I'm sure, I'm sure many people would want that. So basically, you, you take the case, you extend it, and voila, it's, it's, a, sel it's a, a selfie stick, and it also protects your phone. So he put it on Kickstarter. He said, this is how much it's going to cost. It's going to take so many months to develop it, and then we'll ship it to all the backers. And in one week, the device, even called by the same name, was knocked off and was for sale on AliExpress <laughs> for less than he thought the manufacturing would cost. <coughs> and that's how fast we, we can do it. We can do hardware the way we do software. We can go from concept to mass production in a week. And this is the world that's ahead of us. And it's devices like these that's ushering in this new era of computing, of, of life, where everything is connected. And that's it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We hope you have fun. Thank you very much to Celia. I think this was awesome. Um, as you can see, not everyone was able to get a device. We didn't have a chance to order as many as we'd have liked. Um, but those of you who haven't, um, you'll have to wait three months, but at least it's only a couple of dollars. Um, once again, stick, stick around, hang around, ask Celia some of your questions, um, whatever they may be. Uh, what happened there? Oh.
nothing. Um, have have a drink, uh, talk to some of us, uh, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Uh, thank you to everyone who's come to uh, the Rabbiteer sessions before, and I hope those who came uh, tonight actually enjoyed their first time. This is our last one for the year. Our next one will probably be in our new office in Bramfontein, uh, probably towards the beginning of next year. Um, so I hope everyone has a really amazing rest of their year, and we will see you soon. Thank you very much. It's working for now. Christian. I don't know if somebody wants to bring me a microphone or yeah. Just yeah, so I'll just shout. Have you had much experience playing around with the hardware developer platforms like Seed Studio, where you can take your bits and pieces together here and have them, somebody make a popular PC board for you? So you get like your entire own hardware platform back. Yeah, I've, I've seen that stuff, but. I've, I've seen uh, Seed Studio and those things, but I haven't personally used it. But it's cool stuff. Lots of new cool things that's available these days. Any other questions? Yeah, a question over there. You mentioned um, something in between the MQTT server and Slack and MQTT server and uh, the graphing. Yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, I mentioned that there's something that is, is marshalling stuff between MQTT and Slack and Grafana. And that is this. I've got this program called Rabbiteer 2017 IoT Agent. And it's a Node.js application. And what it does is, I won't go into too much detail. The code is in that link that I'll put on Slack in a moment. Uh, what it does is it subscribes to MQTT. It runs on the server and it's just marshalling messages. Uh, it's, it's subscribing on all the topics. Actually, when I, when I open up the, um, the index file here, you'll see that right at the bottom, I'm subscribing on hash. And hash is the MQTT way of saying, listen to everything. Uh, it's like a wildcard match. So it's listening to any message that's posted to MQTT. And uh, it's marshalling to Slack if they meet certain criteria. And it's posting it to Grafana if it's meeting certain criteria. Does that answer your question? Um, what's what called? This thing. I just called it. I just called it IoT agent. It, it's just random code that I like. Francis, it's just random code that I wrote. It's written in Node.js. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so just, just to, to say, if those of you who want to play around, who maybe haven't got it working, wants to see if they can get it working, we're going to help you and, and support you and, and try and get you going. I've got this. This is a box full of censored. I ordered 10 of these, and I'm still waiting for them, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, but I've got this one, which I bought for 700 rand. Uh, I, the ones I bought of AliExpress cost 150 rand each. It's pretty disappointing. But I got, went and got this one because I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to, to come and see what's in this box. These random sensors, they have no labeling, no documentation, but <laughs> they're, they're, I've tried it. It's pretty easy to get them working. Um, and we'll help you to do that if you want to try them out. Question? Um, so just in terms of, say, applications where the data transmission from the sensor to the internet, say to alert someone on a cell phone is time sensitive, say in a healthcare sort of application measuring heart rate or something like that. Would you say in terms of the limitations in terms of data transfer, would you say that the controller itself sampling rate is the limitation or actually the getting it onto the server to like warn the person is where the time limitation would be? So we're talking in a time delay of like under a second. So it is pretty fast, but I'll tell you where the delays will sit. Um, the connection is encrypted. So establishing a connection takes about two seconds. On a, on a PC, it takes much quicker than two seconds. But your delays are going to be uh, pretty much just network delays. Uh, we see a delay of under a second now, and that delay is mostly because the server that we're using is sitting in Ireland. If, it was, if I was communicating just to my laptop, uh, it would be almost instantaneous. However, it is Wi-Fi. 
A Wi-Fi is not the most reliable connection you can get. So typically in MQTT, when they have th uh, sensitive information like this, they would not use Wi-Fi. They would use some custom radio uh, connection. Does that answer your question? Okay, cool. Here, these things scare me as much as they excite me. What, what's happening in terms of security in the IoT space? Because that, the ease of controlling things is amazing, but yeah. the risk that it imposes on society is immense. So uh, the question is, uh, what is happening in terms of security with regards to Internet of Things? And uh, the answer, fortunately, is uh, a lot. Um, <coughs> uh, these devices aren't secure. I could not get away for them to be secure. But the ESP32, the new one, does have secure capabilities. And when you say it's secure, basically it means you can put something on the device that cannot be read once it's put in there. That's kind of... To just to over completely oversimplify it. But as far as securing uh, these, de these devices, um, I, I know people who, who are electronic engineers and who actually make Internet of Things devices, and they go as far as to encrypt the messages that are passed on the, the uh, what do you call them, the nets on the con components. So there is nowhere that you can stick in a multimeter and get an unencrypted uh, message. Uh, so there is quite a lot available in terms of security. They can secure these things to the point where you cannot physically get the information from the device. Uh, let's say we say the keys that it uses to connect. For example, the username and password that we just put in plain text on the device and can anybody who connects to it can get it out. The Wi-Fi username and password is saved in plain text on the device. Anyone can get it out. But um, <coughs> the newer devices allows you to store uh, a private key on the device that cannot be read once it's put in there. And uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yes? There's a nice guy in Switzerland who's written some open source code to have all of your passwords and code on the older devices as well. So uh, Ian, Ian gives some information that there is, an, uh, is somebody who wrote a library to, uh, to hash your passwords and stuff on these devices. The thing that I'm suspicious about is whether you can, you can still get it off somehow because you can read the flash. And so I, I, I think it's, it, it, but it, it's the thing, that's the thing about security is you, you, don't, you, you don't really aim to make it impossible to get something off the device. You just need to make it really, really hard because eventually somebody will get it off. So when you divide, write security software, you write layer after layer after layer of security, not because you're making it impossible, you're making it very difficult. Your goal is not to make it impossible to hack, your goal is to make the guy who's, who's hacking it break his keyboard out of frustration. Any other questions? Yes, another question. Have you played around with front-end um, software and applications for Internet of Things? Personally, I have not, apart from the IoT stuff we did the last time, which was the particle. Have you, have you got a browser open there? I, I do have a browser. www.blymk.cc That good? blymk.cc N? There we go. The most popular mobile app for the IoT works with anything, ESP8266, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, Spark Fun, and others. So yeah, there's something interesting. Hmm? I can't say that better. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. There's another thing for, for you guys to look at. You all have one of these? This is a nice GUI that is practically zero code orientated. It's drag and drop front end cell phone application for Internet of Things. There you go. Yeah, even an electronic engine like, engineer like me could figure this out. <laughs> awesome. Anything else? All right. Awesome, guys. So we've got these sensors. I hope you guys will make your way over here and check them out, what we've got. Uh, I wish I had more. I'm sorry, we only have 37. We're going to have 370, but, but uh, South African Post Office is still in a terrible state, unfortunately. And uh, we've got two power banks left. Uh, we got these with the goal that uh, we would give them away. I've only given one away. Um, but um, 
Has anybody figured out what all the usernames and passwords have in common? Huh? Comics with characters. There you go. More specific? Female Marvel comic with characters. They're not female, but they are Marvel. You can get it. <laughs> uh, you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. But you can get the other one. <laughs> we'll get you another one.